Hey, hi, my name is David Gwynn. I am here with Stacy Crin. It is the 14th. 14th of September uh, 2020, and we're doing an oral history interview for the Pride of the Community Project at the UNC Greensboro University Libraries. If you would please be so kind as to tell us your name as you would like it to appear on the interview. Joel Cudworth or Marilyn Rivers. People recognize that name probably more. <laughs> Star. We're interviewing a star. Um, okay, well, I'll go ahead and just dive right in. Now, you're a Greensboro native, yes. I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you tell a little bit about your background, about growing up in Greensboro, coming out, that kind of stuff? Anything you're. Well, I think I always knew I was gay as a kid. But, you know, in the 50s and 60s and the 70s, it just was taboo. You know, so all through high school. God, I hated high school. You know, teased, taunted, whatever. I survived. <laughs> Fuck you. Oh, do I have to watch my language? <laughs> no. Okay, no, you're good, because that's hard for me to do. <laughs> I remember when I decided to tell my mother. I was 23, and she was Cuban. I was scared of that little sawed-off woman. <laughs> <laughs> And when I finally got up the gumption to tell her, she was like, thank God, mijo. I thought I was going to have to tell you. <laughs> but it was very, especially in the South, it was very hushed-hushed. Yeah. You know, you just didn't go out and blurt it out. Unless you wanted your car windows knocked out or egged. or. Because yeah. I grew up right out here, and this was called Guilford College then. It was mm -hmm. a very small little area. Right. Uh, high school, Western Guilford or? Western Guilford is a fairly new school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, um, well, uh, when you came out, so I'm guessing when you came out, probably since you said 23, it was maybe early 20s, et cetera, when you came out. Can you talk a little bit about what the scene was like in Greensboro when you first came out? I mean, bars, other things? God, we had the Renaissance which was a dump. And we had General Greens, which made the Renaissance look like the Ritz. There was really no nice places at the time. Um, you just kind of knew where they were. They really were never advertised. And that was basically, it was the bar scene. There was no Nothing else. No brunches, no... You know, That's these right. kids today, they don't know how lucky they've got it to be able to be just basically out and free. Yeah. So what were the bars like? Uh, was, was it, uh, they, I'm sure they were all small. They were all very they small. Based on where those bars were. Um, <laughs> I guess more of a meat market type of deal. <laughs> you know, it was the only place that you could really meet anybody. DJs, no such thing. Jukebox plugged into a great big speaker. Right. Hell, even some of the first bars I worked in, they just had turntable with two big old speakers from Sears <laughs> on the stage. It was pretty bad. <laughs> um, that was really about it. You know, where those were the first two bars. There was one that opened later on. When disco started, it was called Round and Round. It was over on Lee Street. And then we, you know, got Davies downtown. Right. And then the Davies that was out there on Spring Garden Street, I think where Jokers 3 was. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yep, on the UNCG campus right now. Yes. Um, I think the building's still standing. I don't know what it's used for now. It is that, I think it's the financial aid office or something. <laughs> I think financial aid moved out of that. Okay. But it is still used by UNCG. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So. But um, they were all small and dumps. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, and I know near the end of the seventies, you know, they kind of, kind of got bigger. I mean, places like. Uh, and we had Wham, mm -hmm. which then became Encore, which became Warehouse, Big Disco, uh, Scorpios and Charlotte. Used to work at all of those. Yeah, I remember there was kind of a. I don't like to use circuit because it sounds like circuit parties, but you know there was kind of a. 
Well, it was. We people would go around to different cities on different nights, and it was like Winston on Friday and Greensboro on Saturday, and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Wednesday night was just whatever city I guess you were in. <laughs> right. And so, uh, so you performed at all the all the the bigger places in Greensboro, like oh uh, yeah, Encore, performed, Wham, yeah. So. Encore, Wham. Um, Renaissance really never had shows. Um, General Greens did. God, that was a joke. <laughs> uh, I never, I think I performed there one time as when I was Miss Greensboro. So when did you, when did you start performing? 1976. On a dare. I've always had a fascination with three things, Marilyn Monroe, the Titanic, and Biltmore House. And when someone told me they could make me look like Marilyn Monroe, I was like, for real? And I did. And I just kind of enjoyed it. Enjoyed the money. Uh, um, how, what, was, what was drag like in Greensboro in the 70s, maybe compared to how it is now? Actually, I think it was a lot better than it was now. We used to have to have, we did productions. Uh, we did rehearsals, um, made costumes, um, had props, dancers, whatever. You know, now some of the drag, I say, I, I just, somebody puts on a little tight spandex outfit, pushes their fake boobs up, because back then none of us had anything like that. We didn't have, you know, implants or you just did it out of bird seed or whatever you could find. <laughs> Socks. <laughs> bird seed was always the best unless it was migrating season and you had to go out with your arms across your chest so they wouldn't <laughs> attack you. So uh, one thing, you know, we always like to uh, you had kind of a following because this, your approach to drag was a little bit off center compared to some of the other performers in town, like a little different, little different musically, a little different oh, approach. Yes. I love doing rock and roll, and I get you know back then. Now they have drag mothers and all this silly <laughs> stuff. We didn't have that then. You basically figured it out. Hopefully, you had a good friend. Lily White was a very, very, very dear friend of mine, and I guess some of my style I did get from her. You know, I did the whole pageant thing with the pretty dresses and the nice hair, and I said, this isn't me. This is not me. And then I started really, and I loved doing off-the-wall rock and roll like Patti Smith, um, Gloria, and what was that, Ain't It Strange, and my favorite love song, Pissing in a River. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also approached it as it was a business. It was a way to make money. It was a way to party and make money. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just kind of like to do what I want to do. I've always been that way. Never what anybody expected of me. It never works. You know, so I just kind of got a weird kind of following. <laughs> I People that didn't mind me setting voodoo dolls on stage on fire or breaking <laughs> a glass or anything like that. Doing Blue Angel before Cindy Lauper was Cindy Lauper. Yeah, nobody knew. <laughs> well, the first time I did Melissa Etheridge, everybody was like, who's that? I'm like, Melissa Etheridge. <laughs> well, who is that? And I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah, because I did Blue Angel. It, was, it wasn't even Cindy, it was just Blue Angel. Yeah. I'm going to be strong. Have seen circuits are kicking on. <laughs> yeah, see that's what we're here for. All right, let's uh, now we're getting in there. Let's talk about the maybe late seventies, early eighties kind of in Greensboro. And that was kind of the wham and then encore time. Um, I know the Palms was around at that time too. I don't think yeah. it was as big a deal then as it turned into. No, later. It, Palms really got his popularity later on. I think. Yeah. So to talk a little about the scene there, and you mentioned Lily White. Uh, how, how that whole thing you know came about with the Grease Sisters, et cetera. The Grease Sisters started out in Atlanta in the late 70s. Lily and I were already friends. And um, 
she talked about them putting this little group together. When they first started, they were kind of, I want to say did like maybe 40-ish type of music. But you know, Lily always had her bizarre makeup. And then they graduated into the Grease Sisters. You know, they would always do, when they had did their shows, they'd always do one production number with the three of them, sometimes four. If you remind me, look back through there, there's a picture of me doing something with Lily and I believe Kitty Litter, who has left us and so is Alvina. They're both gone. Um, Alvina died of old age. Kitty was shot by her husband. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, they came to Greensboro and they were pretty well accepted. I'd worked with Lily, you know, quite a bit in Atlanta. And that was when it was Wham! And they were part of the regular show cast. We had shows on Wednesday nights and Saturday nights. Oh, yeah. And Wham! was, uh, that was, what was the name? Irv? Irv oh, Palachet. Palachet. <laughs> <laughs> the first one was what I really meant, but. Yeah. Uh, but. And I'll steer clear of the whole Bobby Smith thing. <laughs> yeah, like that guy. Yeah, that'd probably be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, after you know, as we moved on into the eighties too, you know, you were you were very closely connected with XTC on High Point yes. Road. Yes. If you could maybe tell a little about how how that started and uh, and what the environment was like there and how it was kind of either similar or a lot different from some of the other clubs? Well, it was smaller than Encore was. Um, Liz worked as a bartender at Wham! and at Encore. And she always, she and I have been friends since 1977, 78. And she had always said she wanted a bar of her own. She wanted a gay bar. And, um, Liz could paint up and look like a drag queen. <laughs> and so she got it together and opened it up. And it did very well for quite a number of years. It was on High Point Road. You know, wherever there was a gay bar in that time, you dealt with somebody driving by and hollering shit out. And I know, you know, I had that big black old Lincoln convertible. Somebody put dead fish in the floorboard. That was lovely. You know, you're always going to have ignorant assholes wherever. But it was a fun bar. It was very well respected by the community. Because mm -hmm. everybody knew Liz. Everybody knew Liz. Yeah. And um, I enjoyed it there. I worked there. Yeah, it, uh, it, was, it was a... It was a nicer place, and it was kind of you know a little I don't know maybe a little nicer put together and better kept up than some bars. Yeah, it was. It was always clean, and you know it was one of the. I can't remember. Did I know Encore had the patio? I can't remember if Wham had the patio, but it had a little patio out back, and right. you know of course you always had to watch for people climbing over the fence and stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, gosh, you don't have a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and hey, I, I felt like it had kind of a good family atmosphere. It with did. Everybody, everybody there, there was kind of, yeah, they were your family, they were your friends, they're who you wanted to see, and yeah. and that, you know, how was it to work there as opposed to say working with a uh, with Encore? Um, I know there was that, Encore. I was owned by what was her name, Joanne Harris. Yeah, Merv, um, Mervin. He was president of the Jackals Motor Club. Straight, big old ZZ Top looking guy. He managed it. He was great. He was great. Um, Joanne wasn't at the bar that much, so it wasn't that bad. Sometimes she'd get on me for my language on stage, and I'm like, that's what people pay to hear. We're in a bar. Whatever. XTC, I guess because Liz and I being such good friends was a little bit, little bit more relaxed. As far as working there, I was more comfortable there. 
Uh, we didn't have to go outside to a dressing room to get dressed. There was one right there inside the bar. Oh, I got dressed in beer coolers and over my career, everything, where people started having shows. Yeah, I remember the turnabout shows at XTC. They were they, they were, were fun. <laughs> they were always fun, you know, especially when people that weren't did certain drag queens. Yeah, it was, that was that was when the staff and the bartenders, et cetera, did the show, and the drag queens actually staffed the bar. Yeah, worked the bar. That's actually when I learned to bartend because <laughs> I was like, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> And full disclosure, I did work in that bar for a little while as a, as a door person as well. So, um, okay, well then let's go. Uh, actually, not on my sheet, but I forgot to mention too. Uh, so after XTC, there was the Palms. Yes, and that's <laughs> when the Palms became the height, and everybody loved the Palms. Now I used to go down there quite often. I worked there periodically because mm -hmm. that was back in the. It was just a beer storage room. There wasn't even a mirror back there. Eventually, we got a dressing table and a mirror and lights. <laughs> it was a fun place, especially there in the end. And now you talk about family feeling, it really was. Um, Joyce and I, God rest her soul, were the best of friends. And I started helping her out. And next thing I know, hell, I was running the place. And uh, they, uh, it was two, three nights of shows a week there, wasn't it? We had one um, every Wednesday night. My show, the Maryland Rivers Rock and Roll Show, was the fourth Wednesday. Um, there was always a show on Wednesday, and sometimes there'd be one on Sunday evenings, Saturday evenings, because there for a while, the Palms was it. Mm -hmm. After. Warehouse closed after Encore closed. Right. Palms was it. Right. But the warehouse, when it opened, yeah, the place kind of emptied out on Saturday night. Usually the Wednesday nights, the shows were especially mine, not to pat my own back, were always just packed. Yeah. And a lot of that time with the warehouse, we're talking, I think it was around 1990 ish. That yeah, early so, to yeah. mid 90s, yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, then uh, some of the people at the Palms sort of led directly into what became Babylon as well. Yes, and and Donnie Smith. I don't know if Ed had any money in it, but yeah, it went to. Yeah, and Ed was DJ at the Palms, right? Yeah, he would DJ there. And um, I can't remember what nights he... They had Catawall and karaoke on Sunday nights. That was always really good. Especially the night Ranger, with his great big spiked mohawk, walked up to sing Ring of Fire, and I walked behind the bar and grabbed a bottle of 151, and walked out on stage and was walking around him, just pouring a circle, and everybody's like, Lord, what's she gonna do now? <laughs> so I took a pull off my cigarette, dropped it, and I said, now you're singing in a Ring of Fire. <laughs> But yeah, Babylon, wow, that was some wild times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty wild. <laughs> Sunday nights, I worked there. I had shows periodically, but every Sunday night, I was the voice of Babylon, as they said it. You know, announce, making announcements or whatever, and then I'd always go like, you know, final last call, frow call. Say it with me, the more you drink, the prettier I get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that. All right, well, okay, I guess I'm backtracking again back to the 80s now. Uh, thinking about the uh, 1980s, there was a lot going on in North Carolina at that point because it was you know, the rise of HIV and AIDS, yes. which took a little longer to show its face in Greensboro maybe than it did anywhere else, but it did finally show its face. And uh, things like the crimes against nature laws and crackdowns on bars for underage drinking, that kind of stuff. How did yeah, we any of that affect you personally? Well, a lot of times you were harassed 
if you did not have male clothing, an article of male clothing on. So mainly it was a jock strap that you would wear to hold your stuff in. <laughs> and it was considered an article of male clothing. You know, I was one of the people when they first started um, the Triad Health Project. I did ton after ton after ton of benefits and raising money. At the time you went, you had AIDS, you needed your light bill paid, they gave you the money. It didn't get it's too red tapish, I think now. Yeah. You know what they do? We'll we'll see if we approve you. No, you don't. That's not what it's about. Right. I'm not down talking them by no means, but yeah. I lost a lot of very good friends. A lot of very good friends. A lot of very good entertainers. You know because of it. Luckily, I was monogamous in a relationship through all of that with Mr. Al, of course. Yeah. Um, I think it wasn't really even recognized until Rock Hudson got it that it was such a bad thing. Yeah. I think a lot of people had the feeling it's killing the right people, so... <clears throat> yeah, it was, a, it was a weird time. It really, really was. Yeah, it's that time. So, um, well, you sort of touched on this a little before. Have you personally ever experienced discrimination or harassment uh, in addition to you know, what you've sort of mentioned before, either in business terms, as a performer, or otherwise? And um, how did that impact you? I, I guess the only harassment, like I said, is you having to have on an article of men's clothing. Um, in Virginia, any bar that uh, was known to be frequented by five or more homosexuals or prostitutes, there was no hard liquor. So you should have seen Lily and I sneaking in rum and drinking in it, you know, Mountain Dew. Not much harassment. I mean, yeah, I had my car egged, you know, shit like that. But I'm kind of the person, you don't really don't want to harass me because I'll give it right back to you. You know, I had people look because my fingernails must be really long. They were acrylic. They weren't today's tips that popped on and off. They didn't come off. So, you know, I tried to hide my hand just to some people like, oh, look at your nails. Black girls always loved them, but yeah. I don't think I really suffered any discrimination per se. God, I'm a hairdresser. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, what else can you tell us about LGBT life in Greensboro during your your years here, which I guess would be all of your years? <laughs> all 66 of them. Um, How's it changed? They've become, I think, a lot more accepting and progressive now than what they were back when I was in my 20s. A whole lot more. I mean, here, there are certain places that we go and Rich will lean over and give me a kiss on the cheek or hold my hand. And nobody looks at us twice. I think it's a lot more accepting now than what it used to be. You're still going to have your staunch, stupid ass rednecks, but <laughs> you're going to have that wherever you go. Is so there anything you miss about what it was like back then? The shows. The way that they were done then and as opposed to now. And my youth. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that. Yeah, I miss that too. <laughs> yeah. The, I don't think there is the sense of family and community in the bars now that there were then. Uh, actually, since you mentioned the Renaissance, I want since you brought up the uh, uh -huh. idea of family, um, there was an article that we found during the research for this process about the Renaissance, and they talk about a woman who ran it whose Joan. name was Joan, uh -huh. and that's not Joanne, Mama Joan. No, it's a different no, no. Joan. She would talk about having like Thanksgiving dinners there, that kind of stuff. Yeah, she did for people that had been, because a lot of people back then, if they told their family they were gay, they were admonished you know you're dead to us go she would do that she owned the Pied Piper which was a straight bar it was a dive bar too which was right next to it 
And I know a lot of times ALE would start in the front door and she'd run people out the back door because she'd be over X her capacity. You go down the stairs and back upstairs to the Pied Piper and just wait till they left. <laughs> but yeah, she would do things like that. Yeah. I never went. Luckily, my family didn't push me aside. Yeah. But you say that family thing sort of is not really there and I don't think now. like it used to be I really don't yeah. of course like I said a lot of people in my generation you don't see them out anymore you know the last time I was out was the opening which was a year ago Labor Day of Twist right and that was really wonderful Marilyn made an appearance. My God, it was like a paparazzi. Everybody running in with cameras and just hollering. I saw a lot of, you know, old friends, and that was it. But then you saw a lot of the young kids looking at us like, what are they doing here? I know I had one little kid one night. This was in the, I guess, early 2000s. I was on stage telling one of my nasty jokes, toast or whatever. He starts hollering at me, I don't think that's politically correct. Whatever, you paid <laughs> to see me. And so I continued on. He's like, did you hear me? I said, that's not politically correct. And then I just started walking towards him. It was like Moses part of the Red Sea. <laughs> and I walked up to him, started right into his chest with that big old fingernail. I said, let me tell you a little something. I'm the one that paved the way for you to be politically correct now. So, you don't like it, there's the front door. And if you would like me to pick your ass up and carry you out that front door, I can do it and not smear my liner. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I miss being that mean bitch. <laughs> I think you can still pull it off. Yeah, to an extent. Ask Rich, he'll tell you how mean I can be or I'll sit there and cry at a McDonald's commercial. Good God. <laughs> Well, do you have anything else you would like to talk about? Anything? You mentioned being Miss Greensboro. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that? It was just like your regular beauty pageants. You had, you know, talent. We had talent, sportswear, and evening wear. Now, I did Miss Georgia pageant, and we had to wear like white debutante presentation gowns. That's when Lily put on a wedding dress and put fake blood all down the front of it and carried an axe <laughs> with blood on it. That was her prayer. That was fabulous. <laughs> uh, the year I won Miss Greensboro was 1978, I believe. And I was Miss North Carolina. Went on because you did that. You went to state. You went to Miss America. Because the year I went to Miss America, Jimmy D won because she did Diane Ross look just like her. So, you know. That was a sure thing. Yeah. But I did all right without all of that because, you know, I did a lot of Bette Midler in the day. I even did a live, don't you know, I did all my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever do anything with the, with the whole royal court system? Oh, gosh, yes. What a <laughs> bunch of hoopla was that crap. Yes, I had to wear white dresses. I'm like, for real? <laughs> now, they were... They were fundraising, or what? I, I never quite understood I what, never the, what quite their deal was. Got it. <laughs> you know, they just asked me one because I was a big name draw in my day, because they knew I would bring money in. But it was supposedly to help with some kind of AIDS thing. But I never quite understood all of it and how it went. And you know, a lady in waiting. I don't think so. Yeah, I just remember every time they did an event, it was like a $20 cover to get in, and I said, oh, okay, well. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it was just a select few of entertainers and other people, and then the money is supposed to, I never, never really delved too deep into where it all went. Yeah. But, yeah, it was, it was a crock of shit, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just say what I think. It was just a crock, basically. How long did it take you to really develop your full persona as Marilyn Rivers? Oh my God, honey, I'm still developing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I basically say when I busted out, I busted out full steam. 
I've always been a very good judge of people, and I could tell he wanted to be around me for limelight. Or, okay, let me carry your clothes, and I can get in the bar free. Nah, I can carry it. Rags and rhinestones don't wrinkle. That's fine. They're fine in this bag. And I was never one, even as Joel, that would take caca from anybody. So that just multiplied into Maryland. You know, I just talked shit to people on stage. The more I talked it to them, the better they liked it and the more I enjoyed it. I just kind of busted out of the seams that way. I'm sure I think in the beginning I was a little demure because I thought I was supposed to be cute and pretty. And I said, uh-uh, no, I'm rock and roll. So, you know, once they put a microphone in my hand, that was all it took. <laughs> and I'd always find dirty toast and limericks and whatever I could find. That just made me, because I'm very, I think I've always been very outgoing outspoken and that was the thing you did you did a lot more of the MC thing because a lot of other performers actually you know, just come out and do their bit and yeah go away. They, yeah because they were not comfortable <laughs> talking Paisley I groomed Paisley Park for years and then I would just you know I said oh I'm gonna be out of town on my show weekend you're gonna have to take it over because I knew I could see that she had the talent there my gosh she just celebrated 30 years of entertaining I'm like I'm getting old. Because <laughs> um, that, to me, that's one of the biggest things to entertain. You can go out and do any kind of number, but you need to involve the crowd. And that's what I would always try to do, especially when I was emceeing. Because sometimes I'd have to talk a little bit longer because somebody's taking a longer time to get dressed. And I think that was just, that was all the stuff that just rolled in that made me that. And people always tell the corn cob joke. Tell the body rotten toast and all of this. People remembered them. Especially that damn corn cob joke and olive oil. Every time I would walk on, I'd say, Marilyn. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a name I hadn't thought about in a while. <laughs> it still haunts the back alleys. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Did you ever have anyone approach you who like came out or said that you your performance helped them in feeling secure about themselves? Oh gosh, yes. People say, You're just you, aren't you? And I'm like, Yeah, and they said, Made me realize I can be just me. I'm like, that's all anybody needs to be, is just who they want to be. But yes, I had quite a few that would do that. And I would help some queens along the way, some They'd have their little attitude. I'm like, well, you got this all figured out. Go right ahead. You know, it's like when Tiffany, Tiffany will tell you that I'm one of the main reasons she won Miss America because she came to me and said she wanted to. And I'm like, listen to me and you will. And she did. What were you, your tips? Treat it like a business. You know, just don't go in there, oh, I'm just a little pretty drag. But no, it's a, you want to make it, you got to be strong, you got to be tough, hush. And um, that was to the dog. And um, <laughs> not to the interviewer. You just need to be, and that goes true for every single thing in everyday life. You just need to be true to who you are. Because you're going to get nowhere if you're not. Was yeah. there a lot of drama among, like, competitiveness among the drag queens behind the Oh, scenes? good gosh, yes. <laughs> oh, good gosh, yes. I, one year, because I was in Atlanta a lot, and they had asked me to MC, Lily and I to MC Miss Georgia, and I'm like, you want us to MC a big pageant with our mouths? And one big known celebrity I won't say, I walked in the dressing room to touch up and fluff my hair and saw them hot gluing their biggest competitor shoes to the floor. There's a lot of evil, too. Um, ground up glass and face powder. That I never witnessed. Saw the hot shoes getting hot glued to the floor. Yeah, there was. And I'd always be like, what is the big deal? Not everybody can be winners. You know, just everybody get along, support your friends. 
of course, you know, out in the front, it was, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the back, it was, yeah, I saw quite a lot of shit done. Beer poured on wigs, especially during con uh, contest. Many times I wouldn't miss congeniality because I go back there, don't ask me for shit, don't ask me for nothing. <laughs> 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 if you acted tough and crazy, they'd leave you alone. I guess that was part of the development of like what you were asking me earlier of Marilyn Rivers. That's kind of like being in prison. Yeah. <laughs> or Joan Crawford, don't fuck with me, boys. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, I was sick of all this. Well, my next question was, do you have anything else you would like to talk about? I think we about talked it all out with relationships and AIDS and drag and there is one thing though that we have not covered yet. What's that? Where did the last Lincoln go? When did you stop when did you stop driving big old big old Lincolns? <laughs> it had gotten so <laughs> busted out. Because you know my parents lived out on Ballhead and we were down there all the time. Al came in the house one night and he had the right rear door handle in his hand. I'm like, what the hell did you do to my car? He was like, rust. It just came off. He went to open the door. And it was making a funny knocking noise and I took it to my mechanic. He called me. He was like, Joel, the motor mount is rusted off. Well, replace it. He was like, you don't understand. <laughs> so that was the last of the big Lincoln. So now I moved down to Mercedes Benz. <laughs> But I love my big old Benz now. I remember and the little that. convertible one. But yeah, I love my big old Lincolns. I remember having to drive that big old Lincoln to Durham one night. <laughs> that was terrifying. Yeah, that was a big ass old car. <laughs> okay, well, I think. I guess on an ending note, how would you compare? Um, being a drag queen as a profession in your time versus the glamour, glamorous drag queen of today with all of the shows and everything like that and what people expect of the profession. What they expect nowadays, I don't really know. <laughs> like I said, in my day, you had to do everything you could to look like a woman. We didn't have injections. Nobody was running around with implants and all of that. It was strictly you were a man and you had to do your best to look like a woman. Now, you know, they just go get... They're not what I would call a lot of them. There's still some that do that. But a lot of them I wouldn't call a drag queen because they have implants and, you know, and they've had butt implants and they've had face implants. and. That's where I think it's different. Because then you had to learn the trick with, you know, the dark line of makeup under here to make you look like you had higher cheeks or, you know, a little foam rubber if you didn't have a butt. Luckily, I was blessed with a waistline and a butt. <laughs> um, I think that's the biggest difference that it is now. Because now I think if you walk in a dressing room with you know, not shaved from here down because your costume went all the way up and you get looked at odd. Or didn't have real, but of course, now I'm growing some that I'm getting older figures. <laughs> but I, th I think that's the main difference right there. Mm -hmm. Is this just not the same as it was when I first started? Do you think there's something lost in the performing, the being a drag queen as a performer and not having to craft? your body? Yes, I do. I really do. I think because that was part of it. You know, what can I wear that will look feminine and, you know, I can fit to match or whatever instead of, you know, oh, well, I'll just get bigger boobs put in or, yeah, it made a big difference. Hey, honey. Hey, can the silver car pull up a little bit so I can get out? Sure. Okay. okay. That's Stacy. This is Dave. That's Rich. <laughs> well, I think we're pretty much done anyway. Right? Uh -huh.